in 3.2. All right, thank, thank you, Kelly and Randy. So yeah, we're jump jump right into here about precipitation type, our favorite topic. All right. <laughs> Uh, all right, so for this for this talk, we're going to look at some of the precipitation type approaches that are available to you in Forecast Builder, um, along with the flaws that are associated with them, uh, what things uh, look like for MBM version 3.2, what our game plan is for this winter, and then the, well, the great issue about too many weather keys, and then we'll take some questions. So I want to just talk about um, the current precipitation type approaches that are in Forecast Builder, and we'll just look at the top down in Burgoyne. Remember the eastern portion of central region doing some test in here, the Burgoyne um, technique. And really the, the difference between top down and Burgoyne is, is similar to the analogy of lift, lift and index and cape. So I'll kind of show that here. Uh, both te both uh, are some basically form of a top down um, on the and they both require a, a prob ice present, which, if you recall, is just the, the chance if there's ice crystals in the clouds. Um, you know, if you don't have these ice crystals, pretty much ev everything else below um, all these other parameters won't matter, and you'll just end up with super cooled, um, super cool drops. Uh, the next area of the of the sound that you're mo be interested in is: Do we have a warm nose? In the case of the top down, you you're it's um, the proxy for that is the max wet bubble loft. And then in the Burgoyne side, it's positive energy aloft. And so you're looking at the total area in the Burgoyne side. Making our way further down the sauna is the ability to have any liquid hydromediators refreeze from that are coming out of that warm nose. So you get the prob refreeze sleet in the top down and a negative energy low level. Um, the combination of adding all these together, along with whether you're looking at surface T or surface TW, gives you your probability of precipitation types. For our mountain offices, the uh, snow level approach here is, uh, is utilized. Um, and uh, in, the case, in the case here, you're just looking at uh, how far below the snow level do you get um, the precipitation type to change from a snow to a mix and then eventually all rain. We utilize, um, by definition, a wet bulb of a uh, 0.5 degrees centigrade as where we start to mix with uh, rain and snow and then once you get 800 feet below that you switch all rain. Uh, there are a couple other hooks in this process whether or not your surface wet bulb is greater than or equal to two and a half you know in that case it's, it's warm and moist enough at the surface to just allow for all rain and then there's also the other hook to um, if the surface temperature is below zero to kind of prevent a, um, a incorrect freezing rain situation um, and the fact that we can't get really freezing rain in this scenario so we just make it all snow and rain. Now to get freezing rain in this scenario which is typical like an upslope situation um, you'll want to utilize the prob ice present grid and just assign zero. Uh, I know last week we had a, a, a case of this in uh, eastern Colorado. And also a note that the snow accumulation decreases below the snow level so you get a little bit more of a smooth approach rather than this uh, a stair step. Um, in your snow mount grids. So um, these techniques, I will say, have um, served us well for the for several years. I mean, the, the, the whole this whole top down technique, um, in in terms of having it in GFD available to us, was developed back in 2012. Um, but uh, there are problems uh, with it. For one, in the top down technique, the max wet bubble loft and prob refreeze sleep do not handle these narrow, warm, cold layers well, especially if they're, you know, if they're tall, um, and that's where the Burgoyne comes into play. Um, these assume a, basically a deterministic environment, and it's kind of depicted on the right, where we're going to take a, a, a blend of soundings from a um, variety of models and come up with one composite solution. So that's sort of like a deterministic situation, and then the probabilities are de developed after that. And statistically, um, if you end up with a bimodal distribution, or even in a normal di normal distribution, you know, a, a bell curve based on the based on the shape, um, you know, you can create the wrong meteorological solution. And I'll actually show you an example of this here coming up. Burgoyne process, again, it's very similar to the top down in terms of the issues. Um, we do resolve the narrow, warm, cold layers, but again, deterministic environment. 
Um, for the, with regards to the experiment that we've got going, we only have a limited data set. We only have like the GFS, NAM, RAP, and Canadian um, versus the MBM, which is utilizing a whole lot of other um, uh, you know, models for developing things like POP and QPF and temperature, et cetera. Uh, and then on top of all this, the SBN, um, we, do have, uh, we do get some MBM fields for positive area and negative area. So I will say that the Burgoyne that's computed in the MBM is correct, but the fields that are per delivered to us um, are blended, in, are, are done incorrectly, um, that they blend the energy values, um, so positive area from model A, B, and C, blend them, rather than creating the composite sound first. And the reason that that's all problematic is because positive area and negative area both have a bound of zero. And so you can have a, um, a sound, you know, one sound that's really cold and one sound that's really warm, and the warm one just outweighs it. It's just some, some simple math. Uh, and again, we have the bimodal distribution issue with Burgoyne. So in 3.2, a lot of this is um, theoretically resolved because, one, we're going we're gonna to use Burgoyne to help resolve the whole warm, uh, the, the shape of the warm and cold um, noses. Uh, we're going to use surface wet bulb, which works out a little bit, a little better. Uh, and then um, this approach, which is depicted on the right, also handles things better, statistically speaking, where you take each model sound and compute a probability of precipitation type off of that, and then for each probability of type, blend them together to get an overall precipitation type probability. But um, with every good thing, there's usually some con problem with it, which is the operational concerns. How do we manipulate the p-types in this scenario? Um, in the case of three, uh, what we've been doing up to this point, you, know, you can just modify the environment and the p-types fall out. Um, potential, certainly, for more weather keys, uh, as this will create a more dispersive uh, scenario. And another aspect is the fact that, you know, as I mentioned about the Burgoyne and Top Down, it creates a more deterministic environment. This one's much more probabilistic in the, you know, it follows what we'd like to do for the roadmap. Um, so um, in this scenario, you can end up with, say, your temperatures in your grids, which are deterministic, say, say they're 34, but you're going to end up with freeze and rain probabilities because of the way the distribution of the models are. Uh, so I think this is, this is certainly okay now, but that's not how we've always, <laughs> always done that. So certainly, again, operational. Let, let me just show you this bimodal situation. This is very simplistic. Um, I've just taken, you know, let's say you, you're CWA. You've got a bunch of GFS ensemble members. They could be whatever. I just chose GFS ensemble members. They have the warm front north of your CWA. Call it a rain situation. Ten European ensemble members have that front south of your CWA. So now we're looking at snow. How, do, how would this come out for the various P-type approaches? So here we go. The top down is likely going to, you know, split, split down the middle. And so you end up with a, probably a sleet and or freeze and rain scenario. Same with the Burgoyne. Um, you know, it's, you know, you're still working with the same, same similar processes. However, in MBM 3.2, it notices, hey, you've got half of the solution going to rain, half of the solution going to snow. So my result p-type outcome is going to be mainly rain and snow, and that's where we, you know, we need to get to. So you can see the definite, definite differences in your messaging with this, and the meteorological outcome, of course. Really quick overview: MBM 3.2 data sets. Um, as with the short term, you're really looking at the HER, uh, and then as, in terms of the dominant dominant player, obviously there's other higher resolution models also playing a big role in that. Um, but as you go farther out in time, you know, those high resolution data sets drop off and you're relegated to the GFS, the European, the ensemble, uh, the ensemble means. Um, and so you can actually see that weight in like once you get out in the, out in the, let's say day four through seven time range, the European ensemble mean and the deterministic account for at least a third of your P type, um, P type weighting. So really to sum up all this information, I created this massive table. <laughs> um, wanted to lay out, hey, here's what each technique does, um, and here's all the various factors. You know, these, you know, as 
3.2 was, you know, going through development and we're, we're considering what are we going to, you know, what are we going to do for the game plan for this winter? Um, you know, let's lay it all out here and uh, take, see where we are. Um, obviously, I've described some of the issues that we've had with uh, in the science departments with these um, various techniques. Uh, and the MBM 3.2, as I've highlighted there, certainly is great in the science area. But there's issues sort of with all these two in the training technical and what would be the operational impact to you, the forecaster. So um, in the end, what we figured would be the best, pl best plan going forward was that we just leave things as is. I mean, again, like I've said at the, at the beginning, the techniques have served us well. For, for over the last you know several years, so let's 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 hold for at least um, for at least right now. Um, we'll keep this all from the mountain FOs. We're going to pro, we're going to approach for the test bed offices and legacy top down, utilizing the MBM top downs for everywhere everyone else. Here at Central Region SSD, as well as the Central Central Region GMAT, um, we'll evaluate the 3.2 precipitation uh, precipitation type outcomes. Um, through the early winter, um, I've already looked at you know, one one case from a couple couple weeks ago and seen how it how it performed, and certainly uh, even going back to last um, last spring, uh, which we just had a really really short evaluation period, um, it certainly creates better you know more smoother looking fields um, because of the way it statistically handles the distributions. Um, I will say I encourage you. To also look at the 3.2 precipitation type outcome, um, you, you have that available to you in the MBM EXP database in GFE. Compare it to what you're getting out of um, uh, in your P-type forecast. You can easily overlay it. As far as MBM 3.2 is concerned, you know we um, about utilizing those um, probabilities. We we want to get there. It's great in the science. Um, so I think what we're going to do, as we've done in the past with all other changes moving forward, is to get to do a test bed. Um, some point again later this winter, once we have had some time to evaluate how the p-type outputs been, um, you know, this uh, we'll have to apply a training approach. One is this background of Burgoyne, since that's again the fo foundation to the p-type process. The 3.2 development of p-type probabilities, a lot like what you saw in this presentation. And then training on how do we actually deal with these probabilities? Will we even want to touch these probabilities? In fact, to try and get around, around that, one of the uh, concepts that we've come up with, and this would be detailed more later, would be this pout limiter grid uh, to help uh, limit what precipitation types would get included into a snow, ice, and weather um, grid forecast. I'd like to touch on too many weather keys. Um, unfortunately, and this is reality, uh, mixed precipitation events create messy weather grid outcomes. I mean, uh, you, you know, you look at the precipitation type research, sleet is often accompanied by freezing rain, and then it's often accompanied by snow or rain, and the depend upon <laughs> surface temperature and wet bulbs. So, um, this is something science says it happens. Uh, Forecast Builder does have an alert in it. Um, if you have, to, if you're going to get too many weather keys or combinations, that's be another another way to state keys and that occur in your forecast database. And then again, the maximum is 256. Um, and I want you to know that the the total uh, the weather keys or combinations computed across your entire weather grid database. So whether it happens in the past or whether it happened on day seven, all that's getting included. Um, to create the to get that 200 up to that 256 limit. Um, as we know that if these weather um, if you exceed the amount of, amount of weather keys, it causes point and click to fail. Um, that's obviously not a good thing. Um, given the you know forecast builder generates just weather over your CWA, and that's intentional because we want to restrict the amount of area that's produced in weather keys. The RISD database is obviously over a much larger area, and therefore, you know, you can greatly increase the amount of keys, and therefore, you're going to get these alerts uh, from alert biz that say, hey, weather grid failed for site, whatever. That's what's going on there. Again, the main cause with all this is having a lot of non-precipitation types. Uh, give some examples there with thunder for, um, 
thunder, fog, and blowing snow combined with a plethora of precipitation types. So Forecast Builder does have some added options this year um, to help, and we're going to keep um, adding, adding some options. But before you even employ those, I would encourage you to take a couple of other steps here. First off, don't bother differentiating between shower and stratiform, rain or drizzle in your forecast. Just keep them all one, all one type. In fact, um, the MBM precipitation type production, um, what, we, what we get from the MBM is only rain, snow, sleep, freeze, and rain. There's no sh rain shower, snow showers, drizzle, freeze, and drizzle. It's all those four types. So just try and, try and keep it simple. Uh, another idea is remove any low-impact non-precipitation types. And you can kind of do that. Let's take, for example, thunder. If you had a, a spread of 20, 30, 40, 50% thunder values, just make it all 30, um, and that will help reduce the number of weather combinations. Uh, you know, all you're doing is you're getting that messaging out there that, hey, there could be, you know, some thunder with this, uh, this event. You could also simplify to pop temporally, go from one to three hour. I know that counteracts a little bit what we've preached in the ESTF, um, but, you know, sometimes these, you know, if you, you got to get a forecast out, that's one, one option you can take. So um, from a higher level, we um, and, uh, here at Central Region are uh, composing a cards document. We've got about, I think, about half or two-thirds done. Um, and that's been in progress to add a, uh, both add a wintry mix precipitation type, because that's really, I mean, what we get in these, in, in these scenarios, but also to try and simplify the weather grid, because right now the weather grid is just a mess. Um, it was converted, basically, you took the ZFP and converted it right over. <laughs> so you have intensity, you have coverage, you have um, the probability and the weather type. It's a lot of stuff mm, all in that weather grid. we got to simplify that. <laughs> and with that, I will open it up to questions.